This is so much fun, you guys. Like, I get to talk about my favorite stuff that I care a lot about to other people who are willing to come out on a Thursday night and sit at tables like they're back in college or high school. And yeah, I'm, I am privileged. So thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for voting on topics. <laughs> okay. This is the flight you're on tonight. Um, I'm going to start out talking about my book, because my publisher really likes it when I do that. Uh, then we're going to get into the topics that you guys chose, and those topics in order of counting very quickly, sort of by like, that looks like a lot, that looks like more than a lot of stickers. Uh, we're going to talk about measuring UX writing directly, heuristics for UX writing. You guys went straight to the biggest topics I have, right? Good job. Uh, also, help content is UX, the UX writing workflow, and I'm not sure we'll get to five and six because what I'll do is I will stop going through those ones and start taking your questions, including the ones that were written down. Does this all sound good? Excellent. Okay. So, uh, people are saying super awesome things about my book, so yay. Uh, okay, I can't even. Um, somebody told me I should make a slide like this, so this is the first time I've had it like this. Um, I should explain, John Maida is the guy who goes to South by Southwest and presents the big design in tech report every year. Um, so for him to say that my book is his favorite book on UX design <gasps> makes me a little short of breath. Okay. So what's in the book? Why, why does he care? Uh, what it is, uh, I'm just going to go through very briefly chapter by chapter. Don't worry, there's only nine. First, I talk about why UX writing. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is for every experience you interact with, you have some content that goes with it. Um, actually, except the one we'll talk about with help content later on. For the vast majority of electronic things, though, we need the content to go with it, and that content has been mostly ignored by UX design, except where it comes to like, well, let's fix the words. The words are really important here. Let's all get in a room and let's fix them. Well, based on what? With what framework? With what ideas? With what skills? We haven't really had a coherent way of thinking about that. So I tried to lay out what I find to be a useful, coherent way to think about that. Then, talking about voice. Talking about one of the things that the experience needs to do is convey its own personality. It needs to be recognizable. When somebody opens up that, that app or that website, it needs, uh, people need to be able to understand it's authentically that brand. So. We should get the voice right. We should also consider how it's a conversation between the person using it and that experience. Conversation, this is not about being conversational like in a casual sense. This is about being conversational in a deeply human sense of how we convey information to each other and get information from each other. People will naturally uh, converse, even if it's just with eyebrows, like, right? This is a conversation we're having, and when we work on our experiences so that they uh, respect that we want to have conversations, that works better. So, when we have our voice, like, we know why we're there, we have our voice under control, we have it we're, we know we're thinking of it as like a conversation, great. Uh, aren't there some ways that we already know that titles should work and that buttons should work and descriptions? There are, there's some ways that, that I have consumed research, I have performed research. None of it is enough yet. We actually don't know. But what I've done in this chapter is just put a stake in the ground and said, 
we at least know this at this moment right now in English. So please build from here. Go and, and bring everything else you know and publish your work. Do more research, publish your work. Um, I think I hit it like several times in the chapter and my editor reduced me down to like telling people to go do their own research and publish it like twice. Uh, then I talk about editing, and a lot of what we do is editing. And by editing, I am not talking about polishing something until it is perfect. This is not the editing process that my fourth grade teacher was super keen on. This is the editing process more like a design iteration. This is about creating and recreating and reimagining in different ways to narrow down to the best way for this moment. Then I talk about measuring, which we will talk about very shortly, so I'll move along. I talk about tools. Raise your hand if you are working in UX writing right now. Keep your hand up if you have a tool you love to handle the UX writing. Yeah. Ooh, one person does. We are talking later. We are talking. It is uh, tools are few and far between, but the tools we do use uh, are mostly about collaboration and communication so that we can not only get the right strings in the right places, but know where are our teams going, keep everybody on the same page, and move that forward. I have a chapter in which I uh, give you my 30, 60, 90 day ramp up plan for starting out on a new team. When I am the first UX writer on a team, which I've been for the last three teams I've joined, they don't know what to do with me. They're pretty sure I can fix some words. They don't know what that looks like, how long it takes, what I need, what they will get out of it. So this is my process for uh, educating them and getting educated myself about the product. Uh, and then the last chapter is all about prioritizing. How do we decide what to work on? And that is hard. OK. We're jumping right in. You all ready? Does anybody have a burning question that we should just start with? I can't tell if the, like, the echo is weird. The echo is weird. Whoa. OK. So number one, measuring UX writing. Where is my cursor? There we go. There we go. So we are going to talk about measuring how well the UX writing meets its goals. To do that, we need to talk about measuring how well the UX is meeting its goals. So let's start um, just by grounding a little bit on what is the UX writing. And I know this, this only got one sticker, y'all. So I know you're all experts in it, but I would just want to ground you in how I'm going to talk about it. This big wheel of content builds up through the first chapter of the book, and it mostly uh, it talks about everywhere in the business cycle, we are trying to uh, attract and convert and engage onboard support and transform customers into repeat customers. That's what most businesses are trying to do with most customers most of the time. What customers are trying to do is investigate, verify, commit, set up, use, fix, maybe come to prefer uh, an experience. This bottom half is all where UX is. The top half is mostly marketing, marketing and training content. That's not what I do for the most part. When I'm talking about UX writing, I'm talking about content for doing. So we're talking about when they have made that commitment decision, when they have started up the app for the first time, when they have bought that enterprise software, uh, for the enterprise software, somebody buys it and then other people go into meeting rooms and are trained how to use it, to be clear. Those people need the get started guides. They need some sort of first run and onboarding experience. They are the ones who will see the titles and the buttons and the content that are in internal to it. If things break, they need the troubleshooting, all of that. So this is the part we are going to talk about measuring. So, this part, I don't know why that happened. Okay, 
let's, uh, we're going to talk about the TAP app. This is a fictional app, creatively named TAP for transit app. Uh, I use three different example apps in the book, all of which are fictional. Um, this one is, imagine a uh, metropolitan area, somewhat like Seattle, where there is an app that you can use with the transit system to find out where you want to go. People can search for a route, they can buy a bus pass, they can maintain an account, they can pay the fare using a code to scan when they get on the bus. Does this make sense? OK. So the key behaviors I'm talking about here are really those goals that people would have. And that is something that's kind of unique to this app, that the goals for the customer are pretty much the same as the goals for the, uh, sorry, the organization. When I'm calling them key behaviors in this measurement sense, these are the behaviors that we know the app, so if we are the TAP transit organization, I really could have come up with a better name. Um, if we are that organization, we know our app is working if people are searching for the route. We know our app is working if people are buying bus passes, and we know our app is working if they're paying the fare from the app, right? So those are the key behaviors that not only are the purpose, for both the company and the, or the organization and the person, but we can measure that. And there's a variety of things we can do with those measurements. So with the onboarding flow, we are using content and UX like the Get Started Guide, like the first run and like the how-to articles that will help people get into those key behaviors. And there's a couple things we can measure. Uh, and I am talking about direct measurement like with data from the app. We can measure how long for a new user, somebody who's never downloaded it before, how long for a new user to take their first key action, key behavior. That's a great measure. Because these things, the Get Started Guide and that first run content, should shorten that time frame. Not for every user every time, but in an aggregate sense, like if you take all of the new customers in one month, and they had some experience, and then in the next month with, actually month by month is terrible with transit because you have things like Seahawks games. But if you have, say you did an A-B test, say you had some percentage of your users uh, with one experience, one get started guide or one first run experience, and a different set of users with a different one, and one of those people like, if you change that first run experience, I promise you, you will change that time to first behavior. They will, they will key more off of that first behavior you tell them about, how well you tell them about it, how attractive you make it look. That will make a difference. And you can measure it according to those key behaviors. And that's just, you know, how, how long until their first key behavior. Maybe what's important is that they do all of the key behaviors for your app. So, what is the time to complete all the key behaviors? Also a great metric, depending on your experience. So those we can use for onboarding. Past onboarding is engagement. So maybe somebody comes in, does their key behavior once, and then never comes back again. This is a big problem. We measure uh, engagement a lot as monthly active users or daily active users of an app. Um, that is really a lot of like people per day kind of metrics. So are people using these, are people doing the key behaviors each day, right? Like maybe every person doesn't need to do every behavior each day, but what is that rate and how are you changing that rate over time as you A-B test or as you update your, your core experience, your titles, your buttons, your descriptions, the game or experience content that you have there, that engagement is critical, and we can measure that based on user behaviors. Um, because really, just how many people open an app during a day, not particularly useful, right? And there's ways to, to be like, oh, always open it on startup. Our numbers will be great. Don't do that. Just don't do that. So 
there's not only engagement, but there's completion. So for any one of these key behaviors, when we should be able to instrument when do people start it and when do people get to the end of it, right? What is that exit motion? And sometimes, and, and really, I talk about instrumenting like it's really easy to do. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Uh, we are getting better at it as an industry. Give me, give me a nod or a head shake if you've had conversations with, the, with your engineers about putting in instrumentation so that you can tell when these things happen. A few nods, a few staring at me like, hmm, I'm just not even gonna answer that. I, I feel you, I feel you. So we can use completion to do things like triggering alerts and triggering reminders to bring people back to where they were. There are many legitimate reasons to say close an app or move away from a website. But when we can bring people back into it, we're going to keep doing that with content. That is our key way to do that. Uh, so it becomes a content metric to get completion. When things break, people tend to leave. They, they're like, meh, this sucks, I broke. We can help a lot with that troubleshooting and with that retention when we have error messages that keep them going instead of like, uh, remember the old school error messages? And by old school, I mean you may have seen one of these today uh, that just say like, this is a problem that happened. Okay, right? Imagine, and, and I'm sure you've also seen these, where it's, it says, to get there from here, do this thing. Sorry, there was a problem. I mean, you still don't want okay at the end of that, but it works. We can use content to get people to, to really change this retention figure and have people come back to apps even after error messages. And you guessed it, we need instrumentation to do that. When an error happens, you know, convincing an engineering team that, hey, for these critical errors that are, are on our key behaviors that will break people from coming back to this flow, we need to instrument when it happens for this user account and so that we can clear the flag when they come back. We want to measure, does what we're doing to handle this error bring them back or do we lose them forever? So another thing we can do about retention is making the experience sticky itself. And we do that, a lot of experiences do that with badges and profile ratings. Like the, like, I have a great seller rating in eBay, I'm gonna maintain that account, right? I actually don't have a great seller rating in eBay. I don't have a bad one, I just don't sell anything there. So that was an example, not truth. Um, but you see what happens there. Like, you build up a reputation there. Like, if I had to reconstruct my friends list on Facebook, God, I don't want to do that. Having those profiles are sticky and keep you in and retain you. And those mostly are content plays and managing that content, uh, whether it's user-generated content or content that the app helps you create. So uh, those also lead into referrals. We should be in our UXs that seek to gather people in, like when we have users using things, using our experiences that, uh, that can entice people to it, giving them a path in the UX to do that referral and a way to track it when they come back. Like whether that is a special code, whether that is a link, that is mostly going to be supported by text, right? It's going to be there's gonna be buttons, there's going to be UX, there's gonna be functionality and interactions to make that happen, but the description of it and what is texted to your friend, all of that needs to be written. That's all UX text. So yeah, that's what I have to say about measurement. Any questions about that? Yes. Yeah, the question is, by support on this, do I mean a helping system that's part of the user interface? I actually mean, so everything in the, in the cycle here, I mean all of the machinery, both on screen and off, whether it's human or, um, you know, however that happens, 
it like that is the motion the the business is trying to make yeah yeah So the question is, uh, let me check that I've got this right. Is the bulk of the UX text that is in these experiences microcopy instead of, by contrast, um, using like the Microsoft Technical Publication Guide guidelines in, uh, in apps and in server-side uh, experiences? Is that the question? There are times when the experience needs more language in it, uh, both to build the customer confidence and when it's an incredibly technical thing. Like sometimes the UX is not, let me build this flow for you to step you through these things, which it is for most consumer, like complex consumer experiences. We take them by the hand and say, here's the first decision to make, here's the second decision to make, here's the third decision to make, and that's appropriate because they're not doing this every day at their job. They're trying to just fix the account number that they had put into the one thing that it was the wrong account number and they just want to fix it. They're never going to do it again. In, but in contrast, let's say uh, an experience for an IT pro where they need to diagnose something deep about the system and we're going to give them the tool for it Maybe it's not a tool they use very often. Um, sometimes, and sometimes, sometimes it's very simple, like you still want to have a simple and extremely usable UI. For people who are uh, themselves deeply technical and want to be informed about the decisions they're making and come from a culture in which every decision is sort of spoken out loud, uh, it can be appropriate to use more language there to respect that culture, respect the conversation that they expect to be having. This is gonna sound like a tangent, but have any of you, like the Blue Angels were just in town, right, last weekend? Have any of you ever heard the radio communications that they do to each other uh, while they're in the flight? Yeah, a couple of hands. What they do is they, in a very rhythmic way, they talk through every single part of every operation. And they talk it through exactly the same way every single time. And that's really important. And they're going super fast in big, splody death machines. So, like, I want them to be careful. This is a way of being careful. And with IT pros specifically, if they are doing uh, complex security operations, or complex database migrations, stepping them through with consistent language at every step so that they're like, here is the step you're taking. The reason you take this step is this thing. Uh, you would always do this step before that. And key considerations are these three things, right? That might be a lot of text to be on a screen from a consumer point of view. This isn't for consumers. Consumers should also not fly Jets, in general. Um, so does that answer your question? Okay, it is, you're quite welcome. Um, that is in the category of things that I would consider to be voice considerations. And in the voice part of the book, there's uh, a chart that includes verbosity as one of the line items on the chart. Like you should be defining the verbosity of your app ahead of time, of your experience. Um, because it matters. Yeah. Let me get into heuristics. The question is, is affect or user sentiment something we measure? And how do we get into it? Let me get into those heuristics. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah, Katie.
The question is, is there a time then we would just measure the content itself outside of the context of the UX? If I was doing research on a hypothesis, like I think that buttons of one word and buttons of five word convert better than buttons of six words or eight words, right? Like whatever the hypothesis was, then I would measure that text in those specific ways. Otherwise, they only see this text in its context. So, no. Like, actually, let me roll that back a little. I would use, let me, let me get into the heuristics. Yeah. Okay, no last minute hands. Wait, let me go. Here's how this is supposed to work. I'm supposed to be able to click on this bird anywhere and go back to here. Okay, heuristics. Awesome. So we're going to look at tap again. Um, still our example. The goals of people who use the app, we've already talked about this a little bit. Searching for the route, buying the bus pass, and paying the fare. The goals of tap, tap wants people to have these behaviors so that they can go in and plan the bus routes better, maintain funding f through the system. like. I don't know if you guys are familiar with our various transit agencies in the Seattle and Puget Sound area, but funding's a problem, right? They need to get funding in. They also wanna keep costs low and keep ridership high. So, they can use, my hypothesis is, they can use measure, heuristic measures of usability and voice in their app to help meet these goals, like if they, if heuristically they can measure these things and make improvements heuristically, then they should be able to meet these user experience goals better. This has worked for me. Your mileage may vary, but it's a place to start. Okay, so usability and voice, and I'm gonna go through these. I'm actually gonna refer to my notes um, because I don't wanna leave things out. Usability is all about how easy it is to use the experience, both for beginners and for experienced users of it. Now, there's an awful lot of work that uh, has been done on usability for UX as a whole. And a lot of those apply very concretely to the UX content. So we're gonna look at criteria in all of these five categories. So first, is it accessible? Here's what I mean by that. It's just a few things. Can you say, when you are going through it, that every element has text for screen readers to speak aloud? That's one criteria, right? Like, can you use this and ha be blind or have low vision? Another accessibility criteria. Is it available in the languages that the people who use it are proficient in, right? Is it available only in English for a population for whom only 65% is proficient in English, then it is not accessible to 35% of the population. Is the reading level, so even, even if it's available in those languages, is the reading level of the experience below seventh grade uh, reading level for consumer or below 10th grade for professional audiences? Very important for accessibility. So how well people read shouldn't be a barrier to being able to use a transit app. They should be able to ride the bus. So, my cursor is all over the place. Um, in terms of measuring reading level, are you guys familiar with like flesh Kincaid reading? Okay, I'm not gonna go into that for you. Oh, not, not okay. So there are uh, tests that you can, and there's online uh, tools for this, you can take all of your text and dump it in these online tools, and they do actual parsing of how many syllables are in each word, how many characters are in each word, and uh, some of the tests actually measure against commonly used word lists, which are very useful. And these various tests come up with like, hey, somebody at this grade level should be able to read this. This is not validated for UX research, for UX uh, applications, but it's the best we've got right now. So, 
that is a way to do that. Uh, let's talk about purposeful. Purposeful is really just, are the organization's goals met and are the people's goals met? If those goals are not met, it is not usable to meet those goals. I hope that one wasn't a surprise. Uh, is it concise? Now, there's two ways I'm thinking of keeping it concise. And I would say that this is true even for the, the longer, more verbose uh, sets of things. When people are reading on screens, uh, the column width thing applies. Like, people like to scan in columns, not the width of a screen. Uh, unless that's, you know, narrow screen, like a cell phone. Um, so absolute length and absolute width for most applications, no more than 50 characters wide and three lines long, right? So go to two and a half lines, but don't start going to four and five lines because then it's people recognize it in English as a chunk of text and their eyes totally skip over it. They miss whatever's in there. So length matters. Then the other important thing for concision is that the information is relevant right now. Not relevant in a nice to have way like, hey, we wanted to tell them this somewhere, so stick it in over there. No, stop that. For it to be concise, it needs to respect where that person is and give them only what they need. And only what they're not sort of expecting, but what's appropriate for right then. Conversational. Sometimes the tapping works better than other times. There's conversational. So conversational is not, and we talked about this a moment ago, it is not about being chatty or casual or like, hey, let's be super voicey about this. Can I ask everything in the form of questions and use a lot of contractions? That is, that is a voice concern. This is much more about respecting that they want to respond, they are going to respond to it like an entity and you should respond to them like an entity. We do that with turn taking and all sorts of things. So inside that, uh, that concept of respecting, we need to use the words and phrases and ideas that are familiar to the people using it. This is a core part of the Nielsen Norman Group's usability guidelines. Use the ideas, the words, and the phrases that are the ones that are common for that group. And then, Present directions, like if you ever have to go like step one, do a thing, step two, different thing, do those in a logical order. Let me give you an example. For the, for the tap app, to pay your bus fare, scan the QR code that appears when you tap pay fare. I'm gonna read that to you again. To pay your bus fare, scan the QR code that appears when you tap pay fare. Nod your head if you think you could successfully pay a fare. Yeah, it's, it's horrifying, right? Try this. To pay your bus fare, get on the bus, tap pay fare, then scan the QR code. It includes getting on the bus this time, which I think is a big win. <laughs> um, it is actually shorter, includes more ideas, and is in an order, it is in a sequence that actually people, like that is the sequence people would have to follow. Makes a big difference. So, uh, it should also be clear. That seems really obvious, right? Like we shouldn't be obfuscatory here. Uh, so let me break that down into four things. Actions have unambiguous results. Now this is really like people think, well, it's an action, so isn't that just the design? That's the interaction design. Uh, but the unambiguous part is gonna be you, right? That's gonna be content, um, usually. Sometimes it's content in the form of an image, right? Like a spinner stopped spinning and turned into a delightful little check mark or a little star, great. Often it is that, you know, payment received, information submitted, right? We are, we are using language to close that loop. Uh, how to and policy information, this is the second one. How to and policy information should be easy to find. So when things aren't clear to somebody, 
maybe it's because they've had a long day and they are feeling uncertain and there's a lot of words there and they're just like, oh, come on, I just, I don't know how to do it, but it's important and I don't want to do it wrong. Having a link to that how-to and policy information, making that easy to find, is part of clarity. Um, error messages are also part of clarity. Having an error message that helps move the person forward toward what they want to do, or makes it clear that they can't. Not the ambiguous ones of like, unexpected server error, okay. Uh, and here's a big one, terminology. The same term, and terminology, I mean a very uh, technical way here, terminology is an, a word or a phrase that is used to mean a specific thing in the context of that experience, right? Maybe it's a name or a label, maybe it's an industry jargon term. But that, same, that one term should mean the same concept everywhere it's used. This, to a room full of content people, I feel silly saying that. But to a room full of, of product people, I've seen a lot of like, is that important? Yes. Yes, it's important. So same term means the same concept. And the same concepts use the same term. Okay, so let's talk about voice. Uh, the voice is what makes the experience recognizable. It makes it reflect the brand. It makes it, uh, like, people will assign feelings to things. People will assign personalities to, the thing, to things. This is something people do all the time. And let me tell you, my little car called Sparky is lovely and has uh, a very willing attitude. Like, it's ridiculous. It's a Chevy Spark. It, doesn't, it didn't come with any of that personality from the factory. I gave it all to it. I know this intellectually, and yet this is just something humans do. And humans will do this to your experience. So it is something we should design. So uh, let's talk about the concept. The concepts are the ideas that you uh, talk about when they are appropriate. Like, have you ever had a friend who gets a new hobby and they talk about that new hobby a lot? And like there's a dead moment and then they bring up their hobby again? Or maybe it's not a hobby, maybe it's a new relationship. Maybe it's a new first time parent and they are fascinated with the things right in front of them. What we associate the topics people talk about with their personality. So we can do the same thing in our experiences. We can choose what are the important things for the, the TAP app to be talking about. Maybe it's about saving uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because you're doing this green thing and riding the bus. Great. It is uh, when it is appropriate, not when it is, like, we want to keep it concise. We don't want to just be putting in all this irrelevant nonsense. It is relevant because it is relevant to the app itself, to the experience. So, the vocabulary. This is not the extensive terminology list, right? This is how are the, the key words, the key ideas uh, used this is a lot closer to brand, uh, branding guidelines than to terminology. This is, how do we talk about it? Like, for the membership app that is one of the other examples in the book, the people who belong to the club that, it, that people have membership in are always called members, and they are never called, like, uh, former members. There's other things that are spelled out in the, the voice chart to avoid that, right? There, there is a certain formality of tone, and that voice chart handles it. Uh, it occurs to me, like, I'm spending more time discussing each one of these voice things, but in the sense of heuristics, what we can do when we are measuring it is we can say, do these screens 
get, like once we've defined our voice, we can say, does this experience that we are heuristically measuring, does it cover these concepts that we've said are important? Why or why not? Does it cover, the, does it use the vocabulary appropriately? Are there places we could improve that? And then verbosity, is it using the right numbers of words, essentially? It's the, should, if it says that we should, you know, strive for a formal tone and use paragraphs instead of single lines, has it done that? Has it, or has it done the opposite and say, like, we should never go on to thir a third line, maybe that's the verbosity guideline, then great. We can measure that. We can assess that. So then the grammar. We have a huge number of ways to say things in English because every time we run across a new language, we go like, oh boy, we have another way to say that now. That's great. Uh, and frankly, most languages have plenty of ways to say things. Like you can construct sentences in any number of ways and we get to define what are the right ways for this experience to do that. Like probably the clearest way in English is to have very simple subject, verb, predicate constructions. But that's not appropriate for every circumstance. And by choosing that as part of the voice, we can say, oh, wait, this, this is always future looking, so like we want to be considered edgy and always future looking. So if we can phrase it in the future tense all the time, boy, that sounds exhausting. Um, <laughs> then we'll do that, we'll go for it. Great, that's a voice decision that we can then assess against. Uh, and then punctuation and capitalization. Now, this can be a huge thing. I love, I love asking people this. Please raise your hand if you use terminal punctuation frequently in text messages. Yeah, yeah, and you hear about it a lot. Um, raise your hand if you never use terminal punctuation in text messages. Yeah. It is, it conveys something, right? Like, and I find myself like, I change it up like depending on who I'm talking to a lot, like, uh, are there any holdouts who do not use emoji? Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I see you, you're good. I mean, these are choices and they make an enormous difference. And honestly, the, the UX and especially the visual design uh, people who are making, say, at, at big companies like I've been at, like Google and Microsoft, they're like, these are typographic considerations. These are decisions to be made by the, the visual designer because it has such an impact on these things. And I say, great, as long as we're okay with yelling at them all the time because you want the all caps. Like, is it okay if when we read through this, then I'm just gonna yell all the answers up at the top and then use a tone like this. And they're like, that's not how we meant it. Yeah. Yeah, and in the book I talk uh, in the, I think in the description section of the text patterns, more about the, because that's really the only place that I talk about blocks of text, where the, the ragged write makes more of a difference, uh, ragged write versus justified and the scanning of it. Um, and actually, I don't think I mentioned at all the ragged write versus justified. Um, and that is mostly because I didn't think of it. It is not something that's come up an awful lot in the, the interfaces I've worked on. It does come up a lot more for uh, more verbose applications.
Absolutely. So when it comes to where the words wrap, I definitely force that where I need to. Um, and what it does is it, uh, there's sort of a, a, it's a somewhat well studied but not conditionally studied in UX studied uh, about primacy uh, of words and where people read them and where people notice them. But definitely even just stuff that my old poetry teacher would say about phrasing and educating the eye about grouping different sets of words together makes an enormous difference to understandability. Yeah, the comment was about widows and orphans and the conversations that used to happen there. And the widows and orphans, for people who missed those splendid conversations, are when there is one last word on a new line, right? And sometimes one uh, last word on a new page because it would wrap to the, the next page. And and a variety of other things similar to that. And it... Uh, the number of one-off design changes or margin changes or text box size changes to deal with things like that really happens less now. And I think that that's in part because the tools are better so that the coders don't need to make those trade-offs as often. Um, and in part because we got exhausted <laughs> from those conversations. Okay, sure. Okay, so that takes us through the heuristic measurement. So this is actually a really good time for questions about that, that direct measurement or heuristic measurement, or why I've left out UX research measurement. So where I am on UR is, oh God, they're so valuable and so rare of a commodity still. Like we need more UX researchers in UX departments doing their very valuable work. And the variety of things that they can do uh, and put time towards and seek answers on, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes expertise. And I didn't want to recreate that in this book. Um, there are great books out there, there are great resources and we should use the humans who are consuming those resources. Uh, and we should be consuming the, the, not only the results of their research, but sitting into that research and listening to the words that people use naturally when they are talking about these subjects that we're trying to write for. Right? So that's all wonderful. Uh, getting people to do the A-B testing, super hard, super hard to do well, and super valuable when it's really necessary. Yeah. Alex? The question is, what's helped me the most uh, when, sorry, can you say, yeah, to, to get the voice of the brand from a brand strategy person, the very most helpful thing has been working with them on filling out a voice chart and saying, what are the product principles first, and everything else falls out of those. How are we, uh, what are the key concepts that adhere to those principles so that I can make sure that we mention them? What are the, what's the vocabulary, what are the, the key words that we should be using? Like, having input into all of those is the very best thing I've gotten from brand strategy. Um, and then I'm able to feed back to them like, hey, here's a way we're going to talk about it when they're actually doing it. And, and that having that partnership, that collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
So the question is, what, is the, the new, what are the nuances between concise for usability and defining maybe a verbosity that isn't concise on the voice side? The nuance here is, it's in deliberate tension. It is, it is always going to be in tension um, because we can, uh, we have permission in the product to make it, uh, you, you talked about design should be concise too and the design should be simple or, or get out of people's way is another way I've heard that put. They, we need to be in people's way enough to, so that they recognize that we're there. Like it is a very devious pattern that can exist where, oh look, it's just so invisible and easy, people don't notice it. And then they're giving us all their data. Isn't that great? Don't do that. We need to show up sometimes and we need to, to make it clear what's happening. So it is in tension, but that tension should be deliberate. So what I'm hoping uh, with this kind of thing, what I, what I use it for is to say, we are trying to be so super concise and our verbosity we're gonna even define as very, very short and that's gonna hurt our clarity. Are we all good with that? Yeah. Let me, let me open up to a few more. Yeah, yeah, no. It is darker in this part of the room too, so, yeah? Yes. So the question is, how do I balance clear and concise with experiences that will really sour the experience? Can, yeah, you want to have the sign up that says, don't press this big red button. Don't do it. Um, honestly, in most cases, it's a question of removing the sign that says, don't press this big red button, and preferably removing the big red button, right? So I think that when we are trying to mitigate bad things, we are, at least my experience, uh, in memorably in Xbox and in Microsoft Education, um, there were some situations where it's like, oh, we're going out with an experimental thing. It could all go terribly wrong. We better put up guardrails around that. And it's the end of development, and so we can't afford to do a lot of the right thing, so let's put up words that will tell them not to do the thing. What I always, what always seems to work at least a little bit is instead of putting up the sign saying, don't press the big red button, say, go over there, press the green button. Press the green button. The red button isn't even there. We're not talking about the red button. Um, so it's tough. And it's especially tough because you're in rooms full of stressed out people who are like, but we must tell them that it will be terrible if they do the thing. And in those cases, using your interpersonal skills to take the temperature down of the room, and really it's an interpersonal skills problem of like, we don't need to go in there, we need to not alarm them by being alarmed at them. We need to be like the flight attendants. Flight attendants, a key skill is being unflappable, right? Because everybody looks at the flight attendant. If it's really bumpy, there's a lot of turbulence, everybody looks at the flight attendant, and the flight attendant's going, Right, like they get an extra saunter in their step just to indicate that everything is okay. And it works. Yeah. Yeah, so the two questions are, if I'm going to get this right. <laughs> so how do, I, uh, how do I get away from the, you know, let's just fix the words here. Is that the first question? 
let's just fix the words. And then that, I think, goes into the second question of how do we get away from just going from fixing the words here to fixing the words here to fixing the words on there? Oh my God, that's on fire too. How about that other thing? Okay, go fix it. That is a never ending cycle of just, holy crap, how are we gonna do that? Actually, let me, let me show you this prioritization thing. <laughs> the people who are there for the project kickoff also don't know why they're in the room. I found that out. Like many of the people in there, they're like, what are we here for? I don't know. I hear there's a new project. Um, getting in that room does make a big difference, but it does not solve most of the problems. Uh, uh, this one. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So this is how I try to arrange the work. Um, and a lot of it is making it very clear. Uh, really, I get my flight attendant solder on, saunter on. Like, this is all fine. It's all fine. It's going to be fine. And I say, the most valuable work I can do is the, the new experiences that are the big bets, right? And if there are no new experiences being designed that are the big bets, great. Then I'm gonna work on unblocking design and research and engineering, right? I'm gonna say, what is it you need? What are you stuck on that you can't continue? Let me make sure I'm doing those. And those are, those are fires that I will keep burning, right? but not for bug fixes for the P2 bugs that the person is finally working on that Friday afternoon. No, those are not my fires. And then the text that affects liability, like one of the most important, most valuable things that UX writers do is protect the, the organization from liability by disclosing important information uh, at the right times and in the right ways. Uh, and and in any number of ways. So those are the urgent and important things. And everything else is not urgent or important. So the things that are not urgent but still important are the strategic work, right? Which includes the, like the big sets of broken content that you're like, this flow has never worked. Nobody's working on it. And this flow has never worked. We've just decided to ignore it as a company. Great. But if you can come in and have text fixes for the whole thing and point out these text fixes are super cheap and much more important than those P2 bugs that that engineer wants strings for on that Friday afternoon, somebody will get this in. And that is impact that content can make. So. There's also doing the research on the effectiveness and usability of existing flows. There's updating the voice and terminology or establishing it to begin with and partnering with the design leadership on the strategy. If we're not doing those things that are key and important uh, and that move the needle on things, then we are not making an impact for that organization and we are not really bringing the power of what we can do to bear because we are working on first drafts of super common text or error messages. Like first drafts of error messages should legitimately come from engineering and from product, right? For the most part, great, have them do the first draft, have them put as much information as possible into it so that you've got all of the data to work from. And then the not urgent and not important never do this, arguing about grammar. Argue about clarity, argue about concision, argue about usefulness, argue about voice. But if it's, if it's a preposition at the end of a sentence, let it go. So urgent and important, do it right now. Not urgent, but important, schedule it and don't let other things come on top of it. And then when you do that and you say, I'm sorry, I can't work on that right now, I'm doing this higher priority work. And you do it with a totally neutral affect or even sympathetic, like, gosh, I really wish I could help you. Yeah. 
and then you let them experience that pain and not go in and soothe all of their pain for them, then they're like, boy, we really need another one of these writer people. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> this is in chapter nine. Larry. You saw my tweet, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. So the question is, what is the ratio of me uh, and what are, what are the ratios in the team? So writer maybe to design to PM to engineering? Uh, there, I, I belong to, I support two different engineering teams right now. Let me not talk about my particular context, which we're working on. Actually, um, I will tell, tell you an anecdote. I was recently in a room um, with uh, one of the larger sets of organizations I belong to in Google. Um, has about 700 people in it, and about 500 of those people were all in the same room. There are uh, and there's a lot of back-end work. This is not all front-end work, but there are three writers who support this group. And one of them couldn't come to the room, but the other one, whose name is Josh, said, let's get a picture of us with everybody and we'll send it to our skip level, who was actually sitting right next to us. So like, we went off and we got this we enlisted somebody, they took our picture, and it's like us and an entire room of 500 people. And then we come back to the table and we're all like, hee 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 hee. And, and Paolo's like, what? And Josh just brings it up, and leans over on his phone and says, ratios. Um, to which our skip level said, what are you trying to say? So we are working on it. Uh, I don't have a great answer for what is an ideal ratio. And frankly, there are different talents everywhere. Like maybe you've got a product owner who is super strong at doing all of the communication in the team so that each UX designer and each UX writer doesn't need to do as much of their own program management to get all of the information and people at the right times. Like, Ratios are a very slippery thing, project to project and team to team and company to company. Um, when you can't organize your work so that you can have strategic impact, uh, then you are at the wrong ratio. Yeah. That is a great question. The question is, um, with all of the different people that you need to work with, how does that flow work? How, where do those inputs and outputs come, and, and how do you go? Uh, and the, the sort of short answer is, I'm actually collaborating with most people most of the time. Um, and like having periodic check-ins with legal, or if it's a really deep legal flow with a lot of privacy implications, for example, it might be that that attorney is just part of our regular design sync. Um, and then getting into a rhythm with the different designers to say, we are going to uh, frame this out as a team. We're gonna maybe do the conversation design and the initial wireframing as a team. And then uh, design is gonna go and make sure that we can actually fit all of those things on different screens. And then maybe I'll take a pass and do the the languaging. Um, I've certainly worked with designers where it's more of a paired design process, uh, and that's super fun, but not always practical. Um, and then there's, uh, in teams where engineering is, a cre is very involved, there's reviews with engineering, and not just reviews, but working sessions, where it's, here is what we need, or this condition changed, or 
we, have, we thought we could get this data that now we can't get, so you can't display it. Could you redo that flow, please? Um, so it is, it is working on the problems together as a team, and none of the, uh, the very old way that a few content teams I'm aware of used to work, where it was, where it was content in the sense of documentation, like we will be creating a book that explains how this works, and then as things were mostly completed, they were sort of thrown over the wall to these people. Uh, who would then figure it out as best as they could and write it down and then get corrections on it and do that. None of that, because it's a sort of minute-by-minute minute progress, if that helps. I want to be aware of time. We are at 8.21. I think I over-promised in how many topics we'd get through, but you guys, you chose the biggest ones. Um, I want to, ch like, Larry, Paula, how are we doing on time? Should I con be worried? Five more minutes? Okay, so that sounds like a question. Um, I could go to one of the questions that was written down. Is that good? Cool. <laughs> um, I am going to, 10 more minutes. Oh, awesome. Okay. Um, how much UX design do you need to be effective as a UX writer? This is a great question. So we can break down UX design in a number of ways. Raise your hand if you are a UX designer or you work closely with UX designers already. Awesome. Okay, so it's about half the people here. Um, when you are working with UX writing, you need to understand the interaction part of UX design. You need to understand that people need to have a mental model of where they're going, how they will get there, um, and then using the tools to get them there, whether that's links or buttons or toggles. You know, however you are making those transitions. And most of us probably have this because we use software in our daily lives. So that's good. In terms of knowing where things go on a screen, knowing the visual design aspects of it. I, I, so I do two things. One is I know that I don't know, and I know that uh, I know the things I do know, like, oh, I'm gonna need to, people coming here will need to know where they are. They will, I will need to build their confidence that they're in the right place that they have started this correct flow, that, that things are happening normally, that the system is, in an, uh, is not broken, for example. Great. In terms of which font is it and what spacing, uh, I don't know. I like having a design system I can look it up in, um, but I also much prefer working with a visual designer so that I can say, I think the conversation should go like this, and they can say, yeah, I can see how that would work. And let them use their genius, their creative spark, to take that a step further, even if it means going away from the beautiful words I produced. Great. Uh, it, it's more about, like, knowing about UX design, the most important thing to know, in my opinion, is how to partner and collaboratively work on things with others. Did that, did that answer that question? Thanks, Scott. <laughs>